Um, I'd like to start by, by introducing the director, Barak Hyman. He is... If you don't know him yet and you saw his work up here, if you're impressed by Dove, Dove does nothing. It's all Barak. There's, he's, really, he's really one of the most talented and dedicated filmmakers um, in Israel today and has, uh, has made half the films that we've screened at Other Israel, so I uh, couldn't do it without you. Um, and of course, please welcome a man who needs no introduction, Dove Hanin. Truly an inspiration and a man who gives us hope um, to moderate this conversation. Please welcome Yuval Leon. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, first of all, for Dorf, all you've done for Israel. Thank you, and Barak, for bringing this film to people who might not know Dov, or even those who know Dov. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask a question, start with a question from you, Dov. Um, so I was going to ask you, what are you doing now? But I think you've probably asked, been asked that question a million times. But something struck me at the end there that, um, you know, you start the film, you know, saying, you know, by being a member of Knesset, you can change the world. And it seems that by the end, you maybe have changed your mind. So I'm wondering, what would you tell Dov, 12, 13 years ago, you know, the guy who we saw at the beginning of the film. What, what, what advice would you give him today? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for the intriguing question. I uh, had many, many questions, but this is the first time I am asked uh, on this. And thank you all for coming. And once more, thank Bar thanks, Barack, for making this film. And thanks for all the people involved in this magnificent event of uh, the other Israel festival. Well, um, I'll uh, tell the younger Dov Hanin uh, to uh, split into two. And to uh, that one half will go to the Knesset and do uh, whatever I did there in this actually 12 or 13 years. I'm very proud about my activity in the Knesset. Um, I had achievements. Uh, more than 100 di different laws that passed in the Knesset. The number is very big in Israeli terms, especially coming from a member of a small party in the opposition. But the number itself is not very important, but the content of the laws is very, very important. Laws dealing with human rights, like prisoners in Israeli prisons, uh, or children rights or feminist laws like the extension of maternity leave. We have maternity leave in Israel, as you know. But uh, I was responsible for extending it from uh, 12 weeks into 15 weeks. Or uh, other feminist laws, laws concerning LGBT communities, uh, environmental laws, Israeli clean air law, and many, many other environmental laws. Um, so, and I was, you know, I had my part in stopping very bad initiatives in the Israeli Knesset. I followed many, many uh, struggles, social struggles, political struggles, and helped them as much as I, ca as I could from this position as a Knesset member. So actually I'm proud of what I did in the Knesset. However, when I sum up the period I did in the Knesset, and I ask myself about, you know, the grade that should be given to me after 12 or 13 years, the answer is a bit different. Because the reason I went to the Knesset actually was not just to make good laws. That is very, very important. But the reason I went to the Knesset was in order to help to change the overall direction of Israel and Israeli society. And when I ask myself, 
you know, sincerely. What happened in these 12 years or 13 years? Israel, is Israeli society a better one? Is Israeli society a more just one? Is Israeli society less corrupt? Is Israeli society less racist? Is Israeli society closer to achieving peace with our neighbors, the Palestinians and the Arabs around us? The biggest challenge we have as a society. The true answer is that on all these fields, we are farther away from being close to this achievement. So the real grade, I should grieve myself, is a failing one. Now I have to ask myself if it is the grade, you know, a good teacher should not only give a grade, but analyze with the pupil why, why he failed. So perhaps I failed because I was not, you know, uh, sharp enough as a Knesset member. Perhaps I, you know, cut short my day and left before the end, before 12 o'clock at night, I left at 11. Or perhaps uh, it is because I, I, I was not ready for the discussions, I didn't read the material, or I was, you know, not so good as a, professionally as a, as a Knesset member. The answer to all these questions is uh, negative. I do believe that I did the best I could during my um, term as a Knesset member. Uh, seven days a week, 16 days, uh, 16 hours a day, and I did all the effort I could give in order to, to do whatever I could. So this is not the reason for my failure. Now, another explanation might be that uh, Israel, so Israel or Israeli society cannot be changed. Now, I do not accept this explanation, not because there are many there are not many problems in Israel. There are many problems, many threats, many dangers, many challenges. But I do believe that in Israeli society there are possibilities too. There are many, many people struggling. In 2018, we could see thousands of Israelis uh, demonstrating against the deportation of asylum seekers. And we succeeded in this struggle. We, we saw tens of thousands of Israelis demonstrating in the LGBT uh, protest, tens of thousands of women uh, protesting in feminist uh, struggles, uh, tens of thousands protesting, protesting against the nation state law, both Jews, Arab, Arab Palestinians, and Jews alike in these massive demonstrations that were held against the nation state law. And many, many thousands of Israelis uh, participated in environmentalist struggles. So when summing all these numbers, I have to tell myself that Israeli society is a society where there are many, many people willing to go to do something against injustice and for better situation in our society. It is true that uh, most of these protests did not succeed. So the challenge is to learn what happened there. The challenge is to unite the different streams, the different protests into one big stream that will, you know, in a way, change the course of the ship. And in order to do this, I think it is not enough to be in the Knesset. The most important thing is, to my mind, outside of the Knesset, in connecting the struggle, connecting the communities, uh, doing things bottom up, and, and if this is the most important thing to, to be done at the moment, I do not like the attitude that says, well, this is the most important thing, so please, lady, do it. If it is really the most important thing at the moment, I, I should like, and I like, to take part in it myself, and that is what I try to do. Thank you. Barak, you've been following Dov for 13 or more years, right? So, you know, did you think it was ever going to have an ending? 
I'm not so happy that it ended actually. I'm very happy here in the festival and in New York, but um, even though we experienced very painful moment throughout those years, um, you know, everything which happened in Givat Amal, in Umel Khiran, inside the Knesset itself is, is it's moment which stays in your body and make you, bring you a lot of sadness to your life. Uh, but still, we also had many different kind of moments. All together, it was a very uh, joyful trip together with Dov, all those years, uh, to meet many people, because as Dov said at the beginning of the um, film, and it's, it's one of my favorite sentences, that the most important demonstrations are the small ones. So when you have a 10 people demonstration, and we are two of them, there are eight more beautiful people over there that it's, it's very nice to meet and to know that they, they exist. Um, I didn't know when to finish editing the film. Once Dov called me and told me it, when it was still a secret, but I'm about to resign. I'm about to, to do something else. Um, I knew that this is the time for me to finish the shooting and to continue with the editing. Now, what you have seen now is the 48th version of the film. <laughs> I had 47 different rough cuts before. It's a nightmare. Don't try it at home. Don't make films, uh, especially not I read documentaries. Somewhere you had 460 hours of footage? 485 hours. But I didn't do it alone. The same way that, that Dove is, uh, didn't do this whole beautiful, important things he has done by himself. He had always very good people with him to help him. Um, I didn't do it myself. And, and uh, I had two great partners. One is Uri Levy, the co-director and the cinematographer. And one is Nili Feller, the editor. She did also great films you have seen maybe, like Vals with Bashir. And uh, she worked with us before, and she did all those Rantals films. Um, so it was a long, long, long way in the editing room, but at the end, the 48th version somehow felt good. Well, I'll open up to questions in a moment, but one other question for Dov. Um, so, you know, at the moment, there's nobody at the head of the government, so I don't know if you're, you know, looking for a job. It looks like there is one, an opening in the government at the moment. But, uh, but kidding aside, um, like, do you feel any regret that you know now when there is a possibility, you know, maybe, hopefully, maybe I'm not sure for everybody here, but I can speak for myself. There'll be a change in government, um, and that also we're seeing maybe the first um, inklings of a change of the way um, Israel, Jewish Israelis see uh, the the Arab uh, parties. Um, you know, do you have any regret of thinking of why did I leave at this moment? Maybe there is some possibility of change? Well, uh, I'm totally at ease with my decision to leave the Knesset. However, from day one, I had mixed feelings about it. Uh, mixed feelings because uh, I worry. I worry what will happen in the Knesset. I'm not so sure that things will go as they should. And I'm very much involved in whatever is happening in the Knesset. I'm very much involved not only through members of Knesset from the joint list, but also for, uh, from other members of Knesset of different factions and parties that I'm in direct uh, connections. I would like to see political change. Um, I think that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is, has, b became really a threat to the very fabric of Israeli society. Although, um, you know, we had problems before. Netanyahu is not the beginning of our problems. We should be very accurate on this. But he took uh, racism and anti-democratic attitude into an extreme, which is very, very dangerous. And so I do hope that uh, people in the center um, arena of um, Israeli polity, like the leaders of uh, blue and white, will uh, have enough courage uh, to do uh, what they can do and to create a minority government based on uh, the support from the outside of the 
members of the joint list, I think that uh, such a change is really very much needed. At the moment, I'm not sure that this will be what they will choose. The actual situation in Israel is, ver- the political situation is, is at the moment very, very complicated. But I would like this option to be to be chosen. Okay, so I'm happy to you see a question right here. Is there, is there a microphone? Yeah. Uh, first, I want to say it's a really excellent documentary in, in terms of telling the story. And uh, I want to compliment you on that. And uh, Dove, the documentary communicates very well that not only are you uh, a statesman, but even more so a humanitarian on a, on a much larger basis. My one question would be this. Were you ever in those 12 years personally threatened given the political factions that exist? Uh, well, on the one hand, in Israel, I use uh, public transportation. So I travel by bus or by train, mostly. I meet the people every day, three, four, five, six times, not only in Tel Aviv, my hometown, but elsewhere, also in Jerusalem, where, where I worked in the Knesset. And um, most of the time, you know, uh, being um, 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 a driver, um, no, sir. A passenger in, in the bus or in, in the train. Uh, I meet other passion, passengers who are, um, well, sometimes angry. Always they have many, many questions. But for me, it is a big opportunity, you know, because once they started the discussion, they cannot jump out of the train or out of the bus. So it's a captive audience for me. Uh, Speaking about threats, there were periods where uh, when, um, you know, the the times of wars, the Second Lebanon War in 2006, and then there were several rounds of war with with Gaza, that um, uh, the state security services uh, said that I'm in danger, and therefore they put uh, guards on me. I do not know what was their, uh, what were their reasons. It was not really a very nice experience for me, although the, the people who came to guard me were very, very nice. They were very angry with me to uh, keep going on public transportation. But uh, these were tense moments, and um, perhaps they had their reasons. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for coming all the way over here. And I, I never heard of you before. I've been to Israel about six or seven times over the last 25 years, have Israeli friends there. Um, sometimes we talk politics, most of the time we don't. Um, I've come to really see you as a beacon of hope for people all around the country, starting with my own, who sometimes feel that their efforts to try to chart a different path for their own government and their own lives is not going anywhere. And it's just too frustrating and in some cases too dangerous. Um, But I think that you give that light for people who are looking to, well, if Dove could do it, if Dove could even leave the Knesset to go out on his own to a nonprofit and continue his work, You know, who am I to sit home and just complain? So I want to thank you for that. This, Yes, very much so. And I'll see you next time in Israel. (laughs) But the one question I keep asking Israelis, and I've never really gotten an answer, and it's really probably a a silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, is um, Israel's, okay, it's a small country, but whenever I've, and I've traveled all over it, and especially when I fly over it, there's a lot of empty land so for all these new settlements moving into already established communities, why aren't they just going, putting the settlements south into the Negev and helping them settle there? Why do they have to go into 
the, the Palestinian or the West Bank or whatever, how it was designated. You're talking about areas within Israel, not over the Green Line in the West Bank. Yeah. To clarify. Yeah. So, because I never see any, I mean, Shiva's down there. I know that's sort of expanded, but why aren't they pushing south? Why do they have to go over the Green Line? Well, thank you for your question. Um, and you're very right to say that uh, back in, our, in my country, in our country, there is enough place for Israelis, for Palestinians. The, the real truth is that we do not have any real reason to quarrel. That is the reason why I think we will, at, at the end, we will be able to persuade people to stop this, you know, quarrel. However, the reason the settlements were built was not connected to just, you know, uh, taking land. It is connected with a political project meant to, in a way, prevent the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. You know, the, the problem with peace is that peace have, you know, getting peace in, in Israel and Palestine, theoretically speaking, is very simple. You just have to go along the ancient uh, Jewish uh, rule, you know, what you hate, do not do to others. So what you ask for yourself, you ask for yourself independence, justice, that exactly is what you should give to the other nation having, you know, with you this homeland of Israel and Palestine. So the principle is very simple, but uh, translating it into reality is rather complicated. It is complicated because there are Arab Palestinians who believe that the whole country is only their own and there is no place for Jews. There are some Palestinians who seek so. And there are Jews who still believe in the idea of uh, the whole land of Israel without letting Palestinians a place to build their own uh, state. So this extremism is in a way an enemy of both people. But it has support, some support, among Palestinians. And unfortunately, in Israel, it is the government policy. Well, thank you to the two of you. Just how moving and humbling uh, for me to witness the dedication and the love and all that your whole lives to, you've given to this, to your dream. Uh, my question is, when I've had discussions with some Israelis, is that they're very frightened of the fact that there's nine miles between the West Bank and the Mediterranean in one direction, and 11 miles between, I guess, the West Bank and Gaza in another direction. And the argument that I've heard is that is such a tiny strip of land that if, when the Palestinian states get established, and then they're supplied by Iran and uh, Syria and all of the forces, that they'll get so powerful that, that they'll be able to just go right through that sh strip and divide Israel in half if they wanted to. What's your response to that? Well, my response to that is that uh, in the negotiations uh, being held between Israel and the Palestinians before, you know, the, the latest was under Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, you know, because under Netanyahu there were no real negotiations with the Palestinians. Uh, there was a discussion about uh, security arrangements uh, the Palestinians were willing to have a state with no army, actually, during these discussions with Olmert. I think that, uh, you know, as everyone has its own sensitivities. Israel has its sensitivity about security. The Palestinians has, have their own sensitivities. And in order to create peace, you, real peace, you have to meet the sensitivities and the uh, fears of both people. I think that uh, achieving a, a peace settlement where, you know, Israel will be secure is possible. But the most important thing to understand is that the real threat, the actual threat for Israel, is not this theoretical threat of what will happen when we will have peace, perhaps the peace will be broken by new war. 
at the, at the moment, the situation we have is constant war. So we are, build, we are living in a, a house which is burning at the moment. And the most important thing to do is to stop this burning, to stop the fire. If we continue this uh, situation of war, uh, well, you know, in, in an historical perspective, Israel is a small country. We have 8 million Israelis. We live in a Middle East where there live hundreds of millions of Arabs and Muslims. If we cannot reach settlement, peace with them, then we will continue fighting. Israel is a very strong country, so probably it will win the next war or even the war after the next war. But you cannot win forever if you are a small country in a vast region of other people. So the only prospect for Israel to continue to live in security is through the road of peace. The road of war is ultimately a road that lead to Masada. You know Masada? And I do not like the idea of collective suicide. Uh, are there any questions for Barack, maybe? Yes, you have a question for Barack? So maybe it's kind of... <laughs> Coming up to you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you. That was awesome. Uh, Barack, uh, in all of your films, and your brothers as well, you guys are just as much characters. And it's, I, something I enjoy a lot about your movies is that you're never... You're never afraid of breaking that wall. Uh, this, spending so much time with Dove, um, I wonder, especially in a situation like Khiran, like Givat Amal, where is the line for you of like, I'm here just to follow Dove and try to focus on this, or I'm here as an activist documenting this moment. Uh, and also in the edit room, where you're spending so much time with, with Dove and you can really feel that you guys seem to like each other, that, you know, you're friends. Um, what does your perspective change a lot? Like when you're saying like, I'm here to make a movie about this politician and it's important that people know about this politician or I'm here to make a movie about this, this problem and, and it's really important people know about this problem or this is my friend and I like my friend and I want people to know how amazing of a person he is and that they should see him from my eyes, how I see him. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, I, I will try to answer shortly because you touched many different points. So, first of all, um, this film is, yeah, Dov is in the center of this film, is the main protagonist. It's a film about Dov Hanin, but it's not only about Dov Hanin. In many ways, it's about Israel and Palestine, it's about Israeli politics, it's about Israeli reality, it's about the Israeli Knesset parliament. Um, it's about the life and the situation in Israel. So in some ways I feel I kind of took advantage of my close relationship with Dov to go through him into all those places which I think that many people, and I'm talking uh, first of all about Israeli people because with all due respect and I'm super happy here in New York. I, I love all of you, but the Israeli people are the most important people for me to watch this film. And I'm very happy that many of them have watched it. We had nearly 100 Q&As all over Israel in the past uh, five months since the film was released. And it's unbelievable, it's unbearable in, in a way, uh, to realize uh, the level of ignorance including my, my best friends. I'm not saying it, uh, I'm not uh, patronizing now anyone. I'm just saying that people don't know. So first of all, I want people to know um, and to know what's the story about Givat Amal and to know how things are happening in the finance committee in the Knesset and to know what about Um al Khiran because um, if you read Israel Ayom or if you read... Um, or if you read uh, Walla, and this is what most of the Israeli people are doing, you get a very, very narrow perspective of Israel reality. Uh, most people in Israel, unfortunately, they don't read the Aretz or Sicha uh, Mekomit. So I feel responsibility um, uh, 
to, to show people many things that they, they have no idea about. And one of the things they don't know, I think, uh, is who is Dov Henin? Because either they don't know, or they have a very, very strange conception about this guy. As you, as you could see in the beginning of the film, unfortunately, it was very easy. It was the easiest um, thing for me in this filmmaking process to get all those uh, people saying such a terrible things about Dov in the beginning of the film. I just had to go downstairs and with a recording machine and to ask people, what do you think about Dov? And this is in Tel Aviv. Yes, this is in liberal, open mind, so-called lefty Tel Aviv. It's unbelievable. And so for me, one of the main things about making this film is to show those people that many things they feel is actually not so connected to the reality. And I don't really believe in the power of cinema or in the power of film to change the reality or to bring... Uh, peace to the Middle East, but maybe this film can open a little bit the heart and the mind of some people. And I think once they are going to be more open, um, they will be able to feel and experience the reality in a different way, and then it can go on like a domino effect and more and more people will be different in, in a way. Okay, I mean, Tom, we have time for two more questions. Hi, I am an ex-student of Tel Aviv University. I studied with Benno Cohen, who was teaching uh, ancient history, and I was also a student of Meir Kepail. And as teachers, they influenced huge amounts of people. You gave up teaching political science, and I wonder now that you are not any longer a Knesset member, do you consider going back to teach the new generation of students? Well, uh, thank you for the question. And the, the answer is very quick, yes. I will start to teach in several universities, not all the places that uh, wanted me. I had time for them. But I will teach in, 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 mainly in Tel Aviv University, but in v various faculties, and also in uh, Ben Gurion University in Be'er Sheba. Um, and if I was able to split to more parts, then I would uh, gladly also teach in Haifa University and in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. What about NYU? What about Colombia? <laughs> what is this? Uh, well, Barack, he needs to spend time actually touring with the film and, and doing Q&As, which I think takes up most of his time, from what I can tell. Um, Barack, I want to hand it over to you to introduce uh, the clip that we have. Um, but but we want to keep on talking. Like we have <laughs> we have time. We have so many things we want to talk about. Okay, okay. I don't understand it, chance. but we go. Um, we we are going. We are not going anywhere. We are going to be outside, and every person who feels like talking to Dov or to me and ask any question, we are not going anywhere. We love to talk to the people. It's all good. <laughs> um, I want to share with you three minutes, uh, which are very important for me. When I finished editing the film, uh, I sent it to a very good friend of mine who is the master of editing uh, great promos for films, for cinema and TV. And uh, he's so good that he can take a very mediocre film and, and makes it look like it's unbelievable film. So I thought that my film is not so mediocre, that it's actually okay film. So why can't he make like amazing promo? And he told me that my film is really nice. Um, he liked it very much, but it's a terrible film for promo. Because I, I'm just quoting him, you have to, to watch the whole thing in order to understand and to, to laugh and to cry and to experience it um, as you should. So I asked him, so what to do? Give me a solution, not only telling me what is the problem. And he said, uh, you go now and you do something that no one ever did in Israel in the documentary scene. I already liked it very much, this attitude. And he said, you're going to interview now like high rank politicians, like ministers and Knesset members, especially from the right uh, side, but not only. And you make sure that they say good things and bad things about this guy but they never should mention the word Dov. 
It sounded a bit strange. I asked him why. He said, because people will see it in the cinema before other films, or they will see it in YouTube or Facebook, whatever, they will see like all those famous politicians talking so enthusiastically about someone that they don't even know who is he because no one mentioned his name. And then at the end, we put a frame of Dov Henin and eight million people who live in Israel will go to the cinema to watch your film. It will be amazing success. I like the attitude. And I went to interview them, which, by the way, was not very, very complicated to do, because it's enough that you tell Miri Regev that if she doesn't have time for you, then Ayelet uh, Shaked will be very happy to go inside. <laughs> and you go to Amir Peretz and you tell him that if he's too busy, no problems, then Stav Shafir, very happy to be on camera. And you go to Ayman Ode and you tell him that Jamal was very into it. So in one week, I did like 19 interviews like this. <laughs> Super easy. And from the interview with President uh, Ruby Rivlin, um, I couldn't use this interview so much for the promo, and soon you will understand why. But I could use it in order to edit three minutes, which I'm very happy to end this beautiful meeting, and to thank you once again, Dov, not only for coming. Not only for coming all the way to New York, because this is fun, but also for traveling with me all over Israel and for being who you are. And thank you again, Itzi. Where is Itzi? Other Israel Film Festival. Thank you very much. And thank you. And uh, we love you. Thank you. <laughs>